Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, my name is Grace Carswell. I'm the Head of International Development here at the University of Sussex, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest lecture in the Sussex Development Lecture Series. The Sussex Development Lectures are co-hosted by the Institute of Development Studies, the School of Global Studies, the Science Policy Research Unit and the Centre for International Education here at the University of Sussex. And this year, recognising the very particular circumstances that we find ourselves in, the title of the lecture series is COVID-19 and Development, Building Back Better, with a question mark. And a very warm welcome to you all, wherever you are in the world watching this, watching online through Zoom or through YouTube. A warm welcome also to Marco, who is our English to BSL interpreter for today's event. And our speakers today are Professor Priya Dashinka and Mukta Naik. A very warm welcome to both of you. We're really delighted to have you here today. And their lecture or their conversation is going to explore the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on interstate rural migrants in India. Drawing on key findings from empirical research conducted over a number of years, the speakers will unpack the different elements that have led to hyper precarity and protracted immobility for circular migrants. They will discuss how local governments in India's cities need to be empowered and made accountable for the provision of services and housing for their migrant communities. So to introduce the two speakers, firstly, we have Professor Priya Dashinka, who's a professor of migration and development here at the University of Sussex. Priya has a long-standing uh, interest in the, in the relationships between migration and poverty especially in relation to migration processes that are sometimes invisible or, or poorly understood at a policy level. And she's best known for her work on internal migration in India. And she's going to be in conversation today with Mukta Naik, an architect, an urban planner, and fellow for, with the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, uh, a New Delhi-based think tank. Mukta's research lies at the intersection of urbanization and migration, looking at issues related to housing, labour markets, social welfare, planning and governance. And a couple of very small housekeeping points before I hand over to the speakers. First of all, the lecture will be available to watch after the event via the IDS website and on YouTube. Um, secondly, we welcome questions and comments from the audience. If you could please just put your questions into the chat box if you're on Zoom or into the comments box if you're on YouTube and a selection will then be addressed in the question and answer session at the end. And finally, if you'd like to, please do tweet using the hashtags, hashtag SussexDev or GlobalDevTrends. Okay, with that, I hand over um, to our two speakers. First of all, Priya Dashinka, thank you. Thank you, Grace, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I think I only have 15 minutes to talk you through quite a few points here. So I'm going to start sharing my screen without further ado so that you can see the slides that I have for today. Um, I'll put that into slide mood, mode straight away. Hopefully that's all fine now. Um, and I'll be able to take you through through our talk. So this is about the experience of migrants, particularly interstate migrants in India, who migrate short and longer term, but who are circular in the sense that they do maintain strong links with their families and they do, do intend to go back home. And most of their investments, social as well as economic, are to their family back at home. So um, first of all, I want to talk you through what actually happened to migrants when the lockdown was suddenly imposed in March 2020. Tens of millions of migrants were suddenly left without work and income in the major cities that they'd migrated to. And, and they were stranded um, because travel networks were stopped and they were often thrown out of their accommodation as well. So they were literally trapped in these cities without any source of support. We had conversations with migrants returning from um, to UP and Bihar, which are major migrant sending states in Northeast India. 
And uh, they said that they were in a range of jobs. Not, not many of those are very well understood and they are quite invisible. So jobs like um, you know, working as helpers for machine operators, uh, helpers for tilers and welders, floor supervisors, domestic workers, which is a very gendered occupation and, and involves a lot of women, uh, steel unit workers, garment machine operators, and so on. And they, on average, would have saved around nine to 10,000 rupees a month which is about a hundred pounds a month, which is a significant amount of money and remitted about you know, half or slightly more of that back home. So all was that ticking over nicely until the lockdown happened. As the nightmare unfolded, there were extremely troubling scenes of people who were gathered in public spaces for help and not knowing where to turn for help. Both the state and central government seemed to be shocked at the scale of what was going on. You know, all of a sudden, all of these people appeared out of the woodwork. They, they didn't know how many migrants were trapped, where they'd come from, what they, where they needed to go back to. And we need to ask why this fiasco occurred. And, and the reason is, it's the way that they work and live in cities, um, the way they are invisibilized, marginalized, and the structures of their exploitation. So how is migrant la labor employed in Indian cities? Well, the first thing is that a majority have no formal contracts. In fact, informalization is a characteristic of the Indian labor market and between 70 and 92% of all workers are in the informal sector and migrants in particular uh, at the lower levels of employment are always informal. They don't have formal contracts and they may not appear on the books of employing companies. Also the structure of recruitment, how migrants are placed in jobs and how they are employed is very fragmented and complicated. There are layers of subcontracting and all of that complication and complicated layers of subcontracting serve the function of keeping them beyond the reach of the law. Um, and all of that ultimately serves to keep labor costs down. Now, employers often collude in these practices uh, and are part of the problem. Migrants are highly mobile, however, between jobs and between cities as well. And all the accounts we heard uh, of their experiences over a number of years um, say that they, they've changed destination through their social networks and also re re recruitment networks. And to some extent that helps them to negotiate better deals and challenge these structures um, of fragmentation and invisibilization. But still overall, that is how they are placed. And that is the crux of the problem. Home workers are, and who are often women are even less visible and in more exploitative arrangements. They're often paid on a piece rate basis where raw material is brought to them uh, by a contractor and collected later on like soap wrapping, for example. You know, some women from Eastern UP told us that this is what they were doing in Delhi, in um, a location that they couldn't even describe properly. They were so isolated from the wider society there. And they are extremely invisible and their, their pay rates and all the other arrangements uh, in that kind of environment are very exploitative. Now, migrants are preferred in these jobs because they're cheaper to employ, they're easily controlled because they're not unionized, they don't have deep and extensive social networks at destination. While they themselves perceive them, uh, to themselves to be in proper pakka salary jobs, even though they were only paid for the days they worked, the reality was that they had little protection from the state or even those that they thought of as patrons in fact, most of them had no relief at work or at home, as so many of them were thrown out by landlords during the lockdown. They are the perfect flexible workforce, convenient for employers, but living a hyper precarious life, as their experiences have revealed to us, and many others have also documented them. The government did eventually announce a relief package of $22 billion 
huge, it would seem. That was after 50 days, uh, but food and cash assistance was based on the basis of possessing documents as, such as a PDS ration card for food or being registered as a migrant worker under the Interstate Migrant Workmen Act uh, to get cash. Um, the trains that were laid on for them, the, the Shramik trains also required them to furnish documents. But more than upwards of 80% of migrants don't have these documents and they couldn't access official support for survival in the city or to get back home. Only a fraction of them were actually repatriated through these official trains. These were the kinds of scenes that one saw in most of the cities in Delhi at the time, absolutely heartbreaking with people gathered at bus stations, train stations, not having proper information, not really knowing what they can do, begging to be let onto trains and buses, um, even when the Shramik trains were operating uh, because they couldn't get on. So what did migrants do? Around 30 million migrants, so the numbers here are vast, returned back to their states of origin. And this was mainly uh, to uh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, which I've already mentioned, which are you know, particular parts like Eastern UP and Western Bihar, particularly where there is still uh, a lot of poverty and many migrants had come from these areas as well as Eastern India. And hundreds, they traveled back hundreds of miles. Um, and one in four, according to one estimate, traveled back on foot. The journeys were horrendous, um, expensive. Uh, they had to pay up to a month's wages to hire trucks and other vehicles themselves. Uh, but some of them walked, as you can see in this picture, and very long journeys. I mean, the distance between Bhivandi in Maharashtra and um, southern Bihar is about 1800 kilometers, and they had to find their own way back home. The journeys were dangerous and interrupted. Uh, as I said, some of them pooled their own money and hired private vehicles, but they were stopped on the way because um, they were breaching regulations. They weren't meant to travel on their own vehicles and they were in fact detained on the way for a while, ironically, even though they were trying to survive. Some had uh, their families supporting them during this nightmare and uh, sending them money and other skilled migrants helped the poorer or, or less or people in lower jobs with money uh, to help them to get back home. So this experience, this bitter experience shows that even now, a basic understanding of the dynamics of migration, circular migration and the structure of urban employment in India uh, is lacking. So, you know, that clearly needs to be improved. So what happens next? We need to examine, it's crucial to examine the reasons for this chain of events and unpick the factors that underlie the continued marginalization of migrants before we embark on any plans to support migrants in urban areas or reduce their vulnerability in rural areas. And there's a lot of talk about this, you know, how they're gonna help um, migrants who've returned home and how cities are gonna be more welcoming. But all of these plans seem to be woefully unaware of these kinds of dynamics that I've just described about how migrants are recruited, placed and how they're employed. And a failure to understand these processes will only create further exclusion and a waste of state resources on a massive scale. So we need to better understand why they left in the first place. You know, why do migrants leave their places of origin? And you won't believe that this very basic question is still not properly answered and the reasons are still not properly understood. And in fact, that's the kind of research that we do at Sussex to, to, to help tease out those factors, both social and economic, and what they aspire to in their lives. So at the, at the moment, most of the plans appear to be painfully unaware of the key aspects of migrants' lives and the social and economic processes that lead to their exclusion, invisibilization, and marginalization. So 
To wrap up, what change do we need? We need to broaden sources of knowledge on migration and evidence as well to include their own testimonies, which were not heard or listened to during the lockdown and voices from civil society who were actually more effective in delivering help and aid to them. For example, the Stranded Workers Action Network um, was very effective in providing help to migrants, more so than government, and, and actually raised a lot of money and sent that directly to their bank accounts, distributed food and all kinds of other, um, you know, other ways of helping them. Migration policy in India currently suffers from the syndrome of for them, but without them. So there's no real involvement of migrants. And this has to change to a more participatory, bottom-up, action-oriented, evidence-based vision of development and the place of migrants within it. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my slides. Lovely. Thank you very much, Priya. Really, really good to hear your um, your thoughts on that. And, and obviously, there's a really, really interesting story um, that, you know, emerged literally on our screens that we were hearing from from the international media um, about this incredible movement of people and, and the the need, therefore, to understand much more about what's behind all this. So I'll, I'll without um, saying any more, I will hand over to to Mukta to um, give her thoughts, please. Thank you, Grace. Uh, and thank you, everyone who's joined in to listen to this. Um, so uh, Priya's laid out really well, you know, the broad contours of, of uh, how migrant, how internal migrants are looked at in India and what the gaps are. Uh, but, you know, from the policy side or in terms of framing, migrants are still very much looked at from the, from the framing of labor. Uh, so I'm going to shift that gaze a little bit and ask about uh, what happens in places where these migrants come. Um, why is it that cities where migrants come to are not held accountable uh, in, in any way for, uh, for them and, and, and this invisibilization process, how it's really convenient uh, to sort of, uh, you know, not, not really need to be accountable. Uh, the other part of this is also uh, the defining migrants. Uh, not only are uh, data systems in India not very uh, good with defining migration or are very stringent with their definitions and not good at collecting data on migration, but there are larger questions. Uh, are all informal workers migrants? How many percentage are migrants? How do you differentiate between an informal worker and a migrant informal worker? Are all the urban poor migrants, uh, which which of the urban poor are migrants and how long does a person have to stay in the city to be called a migrant? So the question really what emerged during the lockdown was what's this vulnerable segment of the migrant community and you know uh, people would come back saying I'm a migrant too I, I you know I was born elsewhere and I'm here but we're not talking about people like you and me we're talking about a very particular set of people who have certain vulnerabilities and precarity. So this discourse itself often in India is, is quite confused at a definitional and a data collection level. So just like, wanted to put that out there. Today, I'm going to talk uh, broadly about three things. The first is housing and public services, sort of basic services. Uh, the second is social protection, urban social protection specifically. And the third is sort of the larger, broader governance uh, frameworks in cities and, and, and whether they, they can deal with migrants. So housing, of course, uh, and, and all of or many of you, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, are involved in, 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 in research around urban poverty and the problem of informal settlements and slums is, is, is well known, not just in India, but across the global south. Uh, but the fact is that cities in India have failed to supply uh, public affordable housing and the urban poor live in these informal settlements that are on the spectrum of illegality and migrants actually live in the these settlements often as renters. Uh, and so they are hidden even within this poverty of the urban, uh, this, this, this group of the urban poor. Uh, as an example, if there is a, if there is a, a, a bid to redevelop a slum or to re relocate a slum into more formal housing, uh, 
renters are not enumerated on that list. Uh, and, and we see these, this kind of process and exclusion happening in, in, in other countries as well. So there's also invisibility within the housing uh, system. Uh, the second is these kind of informal settlements are, uh, there isn't really a very proactive policy to uh, extend infrastructure and services into these. So there is also the fact that renters are living in settlements that generally have a poor a quality of life. So when you when you square this up with poor quality of employment plus poor quality of housing, uh, it, it, it you know lives for migrants can get quite precarious. Um, during uh, the lockdown, we actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the rental agreements uh, that, that migrant workers have with landlords in these slums are tenuous and oral. And while uh, I wouldn't say that they're always disadvantages to migrant renters, my own research finds that oral agreements can also be advantages to renters in, in the way that they can be flexible about where they live and, and you know, things like that. But in this particular instance, when the government came, came, came in with an order saying uh, landlords should, should forego rents for X amount of time, uh, there was not really no way landlords also could afford to do these in these informal settlements because rentals were very important uh, parts of their income. So it's an ecosystem that, that, that hasn't really been studied very well and looked into very well uh, uh, and, and, and does need to be addressed. Um, the other the other, other side of housing, which is far more precarious, is migrants who live on work sites. And these are literally invisible because they're living uh, either inside factory premises. And the, in the early days of the lockdown, when we, when we spoke to migrants who were walking back, many of them were in this category. You know, the factory shut down and we literally had to leave or the, or the construction site stopped working and we lived on the construction site in, a, in an unfinished construction building. So uh, this particular, set of people have, have been uh, of concern, partly because they are disconnected from public services. They're often in peripheral locations in cities, uh, literally away from the gays. And like Priya mentioned, they don't have interaction with the larger population of the city. So these are labor camps. They're often tightly monitored and surveilled and controlled as well. So this, this adds another layer of precarity, which, which, which is also about surveillance and, and, and links with the kind Kind of contracting mechanism through which these these uh, migrants come into these jobs uh, in the first place. Um, policy, even though there has been a response to 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 these things, uh, has traditionally neglected rentals. Uh, housing policy in India, there's a lot of focus on ownership. Uh, so what happens is that mobile populations actually do not get catered for in a very systematic way, and even even uh, uh, migrant rent thinking that came in during the pandemic has come in the form of trying to augment formal supply through the use of private sector investment, uh, which, which means that there is really no bid to look at current suppliers, which are small scale landlords, and try and see how, uh, you know, uh, they, that kind of supply can be regulated or, or improved in some way. And, and there is really no talk of publicly built uh, 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 rental housing for migrants. Even even the one that is publicly built is actually, in fact, with private sector concessionaires coming into the process. Um, so basically, you're throwing money at a, at, at a solution that 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 may not work, uh, and and you've had past experience with building public housing at the periphery of cities, which which is vacant because it's disconnected from livelihoods, and then you're throwing more money to convert these houses into rental housing, which is not really going to work. Um, the other side of this, of course, is the social protection uh, side, uh, and and Priya's already uh, sort of laid out how cash transfers did not reach because the mechanisms were through registrations and databases that migrants were already excluded from because of uh, uh, identity uh, documentation requirements, um, and 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 this is linked to uh, to the way uh, migrants are actually very low in terms of awareness. This actually links to some of your work, Grace, in the sense of their inhibition with dealing with bureaucracies and their disconnect with the state at the local level in cities, partly because they don't often vote. 
in the city and continue to, so it's linked to the fact that they're multi-locational and they vote in their villages and therefore don't have political intermediation available in urban areas to confidently access the state. Uh, it, it's also linked to the fact that they're just too busy earning enough money to send back home and survive in the city. So uh, where's the time that it needs to chase the bureaucracy to, to get your entitlements and rights? So it's linked to a sort of, of the political economy of the city that, that, that keeps these migrants at the margins uh, in, in many different ways. Um, but but uh, structurally, the, the, the social protection system in India has some universal components like education and health. And there, migrant, migrants have access issues because of these sort of street level bureaucratic problems. And there are other parts of, of the social protection system that are linked to location, like uh, the, the public dis distribution system through which uh, subsidized food is accessed. Uh, and you need to have location specific identity identification to access that. So if I have identification that has my village address on it, I can't use that identification to access the public, uh, the, the, the public food, uh, food distribution system in the city. And to add to that now, when there is talk about portability, uh, that is riding on the back of technology, which includes things like biometric identifications, which and this is a classic example of what Priya was saying that the lived realities of, 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 of these workers are not taken into account. I was in field a couple of days ago with, with an NGO partner who is trying to understand whether this portability of, of PDS, the public distribution system, is effective on ground. And he, he said migrant labor don't have fingerprints after they are 50 because they do, they do hard manual labor and their fingerprints get rubbed off. And the government is entirely relying on biometric systems to get this across. This is a very extremely fundamental issue, uh, but uh, but it, it you know uh, there is such a. a, a comfort in pursuing uh, technological and technical fixes uh, to these problems uh, that we seem to forget that that's not what's happening on the ground. Uh, and also ration shop owners who are, you know, who are supposed to suddenly overnight supply to this new set of people have not been bought, brought on board, consulted, which, which links to Priya's points about a bottom up and participative way uh, of doing things. So I could go on and on about social protection here, but I'd sort of move into to, to, to my last point broadly about urban governance uh, and 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 you know what can actually local cities do or not do in in, uh, in India and and the fact is that urban governance urban local governance in India is extremely poor and uh, weak uh, in capacities because we haven't actually had full decentralization in the urban space. So whereas, uh, you know, in rural India, there has been a fair amount of success with devolving power from the second to the third tier of government. In the case of cities, states still retain a, a lot of the power and, 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 and uh, municipalities are not really uh, fully uh, uh, sort of uh, capacitated to, to conduct their functions. So, so linking all of this together, housing, services, social protection, employment, uh, and and, and regulating all of it together, who does that? And that's a big question mark, uh, which we cannot really solve. And that, that was what was so interesting during the lockdown, because the government actually imposed it through a disaster management act, which empowered the administrative machinery, but not elected governments. So basically it went in through uh, the district uh, machinery, so the district collector and the district magistrate uh, was in charge of uh, impose, uh, implementing the lockdown and, 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 and the municipal corporations were not always sort of, uh, uh, you know, wearing the decision makers hat here. So, and this is a, this is a consistent problem whenever we talk about urban, urban issues uh, in India. Uh, but uh, the, the broad uh, sort of rub of all of this is uh, that, Technology, so digital access and digital tools on one hand, and privatization are, are sort of the two key tools that the government 
uh, is is moving forward with to solve uh, a lot of this problem. But the but the reality is that migrants are actually surviving in a political economy in which they have to negotiate footholds with a large set of actors, a very very broad set of actors. So local, state, and and street level bureaucrats, employers, politicians service providers, labor intermediaries, housing intermediaries, landlords. So they are negotiating these footholds in a political economy that's already stacked against them. And tech and privatization doesn't really engage with this political economy uh, in, in a very frontal way. Uh, of course, a lot of techpreneurs uh, especially young uh, startups are uh, trying to do precisely that. So I wouldn't want to sound completely pessimistic about it. At this point of time, a lot of money uh, of uh, funding, uh, uh, investing is flowing into exactly these kind of technology startups, but they don't really have a very, uh, 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 you know, a very keen understanding of how complex these processes are. And, and uh, so it comes back to sort of Priya's concluding point about how we actually need to have a lot of empirical deep research out there which is accessible in such a and, and you know presented in such a way that this larger ecosystem that's supposedly trying to fix things can actually uh, you know be uh, brought up to speed with with things that a lot of scholars have been thinking about deeply but uh, are probably publishing in academic journals that none of these folks read so <laughs> i'll stop there and hand over back to you chris Great, thank you both very much. Um, you've really kept very, very closely to time as well. Congratulations on that. Um, so we've got some questions coming in. Um, and as I start to ask them, I'll, I'll ask anyone in our audience if you do want to add questions to the chat box or put them into the Zoom comment box and then we will we will put them together and, and ask, um, uh, uh, ask our two speakers. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start, I've, I'll try and group the questions where that's appropriate. I'll start with a question that comes from, from, from Maya Unitan, um, but it's actually very linked to another question from Ray Hiroyami. So Maya's question is really if you can tell us a little bit more um, about your research findings on why migrants leave and what their aspirations are. And then Ray's questions is very much linked to this. It's asking about what are the, what are the voices, what are the needs, what are the intentions of the migrants, you know, can we find out a little bit more about about that? Thank you. Okay, sure. Thanks, Muksa. First of all, um, yeah, um, yes, yes. So our research shows that the reasons for migrants leaving are complicated, and and there's not one single reason. So, for example, older men or, or you know, say men in their 30s may, may leave because they want to earn more, whereas for younger men, it could be more tied up with their kind of, you know, uh, becoming strategies, you know, they want to actually um, change their way of living, they want more exposure to uh, a more modern lifestyle or, you know, experience different locations that is wrapped up with them wanting to earn more and support their family. So they can have different reasons because they have all kinds of identities as well, you know, so they may be migrating because they want to be a good husband and a good son or a good uh, father and a provider, but they also have their own aspirations to become somebody uh, by experiencing, you know, a city or a different uh, destination, a different milieu away from social restrictions. Women of different age groups, again, may have very different and complicated reasons for migrating. So younger women often want to get away from gender restrictions. You know, that's uh, a driving force for migration and I would say very, very under discussed and very underrepresented in the discussion on migration in India in particular, you know, so there's a, this whole thing about wages and economic reasons for migrating. No one really talks about their own personal aspirations and how they might want a different life trajectory for themselves than the one that their parents or their you know, mothers are, are, are charting out for them. They may not want to get married at the age of 18 and have children immediately afterwards, you know. So these are the kinds of reasons for younger women to migrate. Older women may migrate 
uh, for example, because they're divorced and that's stigmatized and they want their own source of income. So these are the kinds of things that were coming out from um, our research under the Migrating Out of Poverty Consortium across several different African and Asian countries. There were quite a lot of common features that cut across in terms of migrant aspirations. And I would say most of them, apart from income and let's say youth transitions were actually very badly reflected in the literature and, and extremely badly reflected at the policy level. So that's the answer to aspirations. And in, in terms of voices of migrants, mm -hmm. well, again, it's not a uniform voice. So which migrants are we gonna to talk to? And I think that you do need to take a very disaggregated approach here. You know, you need to be able to hear different kinds of voices. And it's not just about gender here or age. There's ethnicity and caste in the Indian context, which is a huge, huge axis of differentiation and access to um, you know, resources and different experiences that migrants have because they may be othered and discriminated against uh, at destination. Very common experience for people who come from a scheduled caste background, for example, or who are Adivasis, they are, you know, judgments are formed about what they're capable of doing, what their skills are, or how they should be employed, what they should be paid, paid even before they open their mouth. And once they've opened their mouth, that's it, their fate is decided, you know. So these are the kinds of problems that they come up against. And it's important to hear those different voices. So I think you know, more effort needs to be made to, first of all, to learn from all the research that has gone on, you know, so research doesn't feed into policy. I mean, we know this the world over. Policy making is not evidence based. It's a political process. So it's our role as researchers to try and get our findings into uh, into policy making somehow. And I, I, I've been very fortunate. I've had many interactions with policymakers over my career and, and have actually directly, you know, fed into policy making. But, you know, this is the thing that we need to work towards. So, yeah, that's what I have to say to those questions. Mokta, did you want to come in on, on any of those questions specifically, or should we move on to some? I think we can move on. I mean, I just wanted to make a point about how uh, the, the Indian state has, gen I mean, or rather thinking in India has generally been anti-migration in the sense that uh, in the sense that there is this old traditional sort of way of thinking of keep people from where keep people where they belong uh, uh, sort of thing and and a lot of states uh, i'm talking about federal governments so the second tier of government actually uh, acted to bring these migrants bring their people back home when the lockdown occurred so there's there's politics playing in there and then they went ahead to say things like we're going to create opportunities for you for, for, for you here rural uh, rural industrial rural uh, jobs, etc. But then as soon as the lockdown, uh, the stringent lockdown was lifted, they, they could clearly see certain segments going back uh, and certain segments taking more time. So I think this, this period has really given us the opportunity to tease out uh, you know who is most a most dependent on the on 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 urban jobs and des, uh, you know destination jobs, and b uh, who's more valued in the city, and and how do they negotiate these relationships between their rural homes and their urban uh, work uh, work destinations uh, in 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 ways that can advantages advan you know uh, be advantages to them. So just wanted to add that. Great, good. Thank you very much. Well, there's there's more questions coming in, but I'm actually going to ask a sort of slightly follow up question um, to, to, to both of you. I mean, Priya, you you talked about the fiasco at the time of, of lockdown. And I think, you know, that's a really I mean, we're, we, we've had a lot of fiascos all over the world since since the pandemic. But I, I just wondered um, to both of you, despite what you just said about policymakers and, you know, research doesn't feed into policy. Do you think and maybe this is a rather unfair question, but do you think policymakers have learned anything from the events of sort of March, uh, April and May um, uh, in terms of how, how, how to support migrants better, how to, to understand their significance? Have they learned anything or, or am I clutching at straws? Yeah, you go first, Mukta, if you want to. 
I uh, so I definitely I think migrants are at the center of many conversations and and here again uh, states are really the, the the decision or where these these the the thinking around migration is happening uh, there there interestingly really hasn't been a national level move to to say how are we going to think about migration how how is this going to change our thinking but but states are and 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 it's been a very varied set of responses from trying trying to sort of uh, think about widening the or you know make more universal access approaches so for instance uh, when the pds rations they couldn't get these you know the subsidized food out uh, states actually found ways to do this by creating emergency windows so quick registration mechanisms so delhi did that and they also i mean did a lot of other stuff on the ground like for example doing digital uh, you know phone banking transfers to local ration shops from where people could pick up Russians, you know, so there were, there was a lot of innovation that happened at that time, which I think uh, uh, is feeding into some thinking around broad, not as much maybe as, as we would like, but it's, it, it is, it's a slow process to change policy, I think, but the fact that they, that there was sort of policy change in that, that short time frame certainly gives me hope that, that, that there are going to be long-term changes. Um, I mean, I think policymakers are listening now more than they ever have before, I'd say on migration. And I've attended a number of meetings where uh, they've participated directly, not necessarily uh, central government officials, some sometimes have, but state government officials certainly have been more engaged and are, are actually, you know, trying to better understand how you know why this happened what they can do about it and um you know i, I throughout last year there were so many conversations with different parts of say you know the mumbai administration government of maharashtra in gujarat you know migrant receiving areas trying to sort of work on how to make their states the better place for migrants to come to because of course they were all worried about what was happening to the labor situation, because when migrants suddenly disappeared, you know, that was also a crisis for industrialists. And then they started to worry about growth. And, you know, all of a sudden, there was panic at the policy level as well, you know, so this was one of the driving forces to create a better deal for migrants. It wasn't just you know, sympathy for what they'd been through, but there was actually concern for national productivity and growth. So whatever it was, I think they were listening. I think they are listening now, And but they're on the wrong track. They're barking up the wrong tree, you know, as both Mukta and I have said, you know, there's a, there's a need to move away from this kind of technical and digitalization um, obsession to actually understanding what, migrants life worlds are actually like you know there's no real understanding of that um and and the trouble is that so much is received wisdom you know there's so much kind of dogma there it's very difficult to break into that so all we can do is continue to have these interactions and then participate in in these meetings and be glad that we're being invited in the first place you know so at least they want some dialogue Great, thank you. Thank you both for your answers. So I've got um, lots of questions coming in. I'll do a, a little group now. There's two sort of small questions and then a bigger question. Um, a query from, from Maya asking whether or not there are designated officials in the state specifically for migrants, providing them with information about contacts, employment documents and health. Um, then a second very specific question from Terry Cannon asking whether Enrega has been used as a way to try and fix poor people in their home localities. Um, and is it aimed at reducing unrest as well as, as, my, as migration? And then my third uh, bigger question comes from Nabila Ahmed. Um, thank you very much for the great interventions. She says, I wanted to ask about citizenship. An interesting angle on the case of India and other large populous countries is that we see patterns of exclusion and discrimination familiar with patterns of migration all over the world, but within a shared citizenship regime. Mukta has already outlined the specificities of urban citizenship in, uh, in India, but I wanted to ask how the current political and social atmosphere 
triggered by movements such as the recent Citizenship Amendment Act, where sections of society are othered and surveilled, may have influenced the fallout of the lockdown. So uh, a, a sort of a, a really interesting, nice, bigger question at the end, but a couple of smaller ones too. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not sure about the first one. Mukta might be able to answer that. Were there officials um, stationed in places specifically to help with access to all of these things? Maya's question. During the during the crisis, uh, not explicitly. I think it really was civil society that that filled in that role, uh, and and actually connected government services with migrants. Uh, there were some states in which police uh, stations, uh, because they are actually located at the neighborhood level, uh, became those uh, sort of spaces or, or locations where some of these services came together. So that's also very interesting and very varied, uh, you know, across states and across across cities, uh, but, but uh, there is this entity called the Migrant Resource Center, which is now being talked about a lot. Uh, and these are, these are traditionally run by NGOs and see, you know, community uh, sector organizations, but state governments are now thinking of investing more centrally, I mean, sort of more keenly in these to look after their people who are you know, working elsewhere. So that's definitely sort of the grievance redressal or the support kiosk or desk model is, 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 is one of those solutions that's now very much being talked about. Uh, the, the second question on Narega, yes, of course, during this time, the, the, one of the key uh, key uh, aspects of the migrant relief package was an increased, immediate and increased allocation to the to the rural employment guarantee, uh, which which some states used very well, but it, it, it they, and they saw increased uptake during this period, but then that also dropped when the markets opened up again and people were able to go back. So, so, so there are spatial variations here, but uh, it did help, I think, to tide certain segments over uh, during this period. I think, I mean, what I heard from um, people that we spoke to, and that's me and, and some other people that I'm working with in India, um, was that most of the migrants did not have job cards that would allow them to work on uh, Narega projects. So, you know, there was a problem there already, and that didn't um, improve, uh, even though they did express their desire to, or they at least said that they wanted to get a job card, whether or not they actually took up the work was another story, but they didn't get job cards, they never had them and couldn't get them. And also there was all kinds of irregularities in um, the way things are measured and the way they're paid. And generally they weren't too happy with the way that Enrega was unfolding in the places that they, and this I'm talking about UP and Bihar migrants here. So I wouldn't be able to kind of generalize. And that too is a very small, um, you know, sample or look at their experiences, but that's what I heard. And on the citizenship question, um, well, I do feel that because of that kind of backdrop of what was going on with uh, the Citizenship Amendment Act, there was the, a sort of heightened, you know, uh, awareness or the heightened concern about non-Indians being in India. I mean, this has been going on for some time and, you know, this concern that non-Indians will be claiming Indian benefits. So that was one of uh, the reasons that kind of, I think, heightened um, this sort of monitoring of who was actually a deserving candidate for state assistance. I mean, obviously the link was never made explicitly, but one can kind of speculate that this was the reason, you know, there has been a progressive sort of heightening of, um, shall we say, paranoia about outsiders taking taking uh, benefits and, and sort of trying to claim them through uh, dishonest means. So this was, you know, one of the reasons for uh, being very stringent about requiring documents. Uh, they weren't prepared to take sort of community or NGO systems of identification and validation, which I think was a huge mistake at a time like that. You know, there should have been um, assistance offered on a humanitarian basis. You know, this kind of insisting on documents actually resulted in huge human suffering. 
So yeah, there, uh, there probably is a connection, but one can't be sure. Yeah, it's it's also because the scale was so um, the scale was so much, and it happened at a, in, during a very finite period of time. I think it was hard, and there was a lockdown. It was hard to document these sort of uh, you know differences. So especially the CAA and NRC that that Nabila you're referring to actually uh, uh, causes anxieties in some very specific groups, uh, specific types of populations. And we're certainly seeing those anxieties manifest themselves in other, other areas. Uh, for instance, uh, moves to regularize illegal property uh, have backfired in certain parts of Delhi uh, because uh, 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 Muslim localities will not submit documentation to any scheme for fear of being targeted, for fear of their property being taken away, for fear of violence being created, and for fear of then being caught inside and, and accused of, of, of perpetrating that violence, which is what they their interpretation of the aftermath of the CANRC and the Delhi riots is. So there are deep anxieties, and I'm sure they played out and, 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 and affected, but, but the larger crisis uh, did not, I think, overtly in India, it, it certainly felt like we had moved from one crisis to another rather than uh, uh, sort of coming together or, a, or a sliding in from one to the other. It actually felt like a distinct crisis with a new set of you know, imperatives and a new set of responses. But I'd also like to point out that the aid on the ground, who was giving the aid, so, so the state was clearly being, uh, you know, was having a difficult time and, 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 and civil society, what is civil society? Because a lot of civil society in, Indian, in, in the Indian context now is temple associations. And I mean, often often linked with religious bodies, not, not secular necessarily, uh, you know, and, and, and even a lot of, of traditionally also a lot of like soup kitchens and, and food food kitchens were always run by religious organizations. So I'm, I'm quite sure that, uh, you know, there, were, there, there, there was an experience uh, of, of your identity and, and, and concerns over citizenship uh, in the lived experience. Great, thank you. Thank you for that really, really good um, further exploration of that. Um, there are lots more questions coming in. I'm just trying to pick out or, or group them together slightly. Um, we've got a question um, from Franita Chowdhury who asks, you know, it's several months now um, since the lockdown is over. Can you tell us a bit more about what the data is suggesting about kind of what's happened since? So have people um, gone back to the cities? Uh, are they deciding to stay at home? You know, what, what, what's the story that's coming out, sort of bringing it up to, to current day? And this is certainly a question that I'm really interested to know the answer to myself. Um, well, the tables have turned a little bit because the migrants that, you know, we were speaking to in, in the UP and Bihar were saying that the, the contractors and employers were calling them up all the time and they weren't answering the phone this time. So that was nice to hear. And they said that, but, you know, it didn't necessarily mean it was a happy situation because they, they were back home. The problems were many, you know, because they weren't sending money back anymore. Their families had had to spend to kind of bail them out sometimes and you know they were sort of without work and not really knowing and without you know access to many resources back at home as well through government schemes so they were um, wondering what to do next and they were resigned to the fact that they would probably have to go back some of them said that they would go back to the same jobs you know despite the horrendous experience that they'd had because ultimately those were the jobs that were you know, going to offer them a kind of route out of whatever they were seeking a route out of. So, and they were comparing it with um, you know, their employment in you know, nearby, even non-farm work. So I was looking through my notes again today, and um, I remember one of them said that in a factory, a garment factory that's recently opened, near where he was living, they pay peace rates. So, um, you know, no matter, he was, as he said, so what he was saying is that no matter how fast we run the machine, we're not going to earn more than 250 rupees a day at the rate they pay us per stitch. You know, that's how they were paid. Whereas they said that when they go to Surat or Bhivandi or wherever they are, 
they're paid monthly, even though it's, you know, not really a formal contract and they're paid only for the days they work. They, they, they feel that's a lot better because they know how much money they're going to get. You know, they can send money home. They've managed to invest in, say, private schooling for their children or leasing in a bit more land. You know, some incremental changes have happened in their families as a result of that migration. They don't see that happening locally. And plus, they feel, you know, those old relationships of humiliate, humiliation and exploitation uh, are abhorrent. They don't want to be there. You know, they simply do not want to interact with those people um, to work, you know, to, to live and to earn. So that's the reason uh, that drove them out in the first place. And I think that is the reason that will continue to make them leave. And I don't think that any of these schemes that are being designed to keep them back are thinking through all of these reasons properly. You know, they don't touch on them. They're all technical fixes, as Mukta said, you know, it's not, it's not going to work. So that's what I know. I don't know about the numbers though. Yeah, numbers are a weak point for sure. And, and you know, states actually made, some states at least made detailed databases of the people who returned and are tracking uh, some of this, but this is not publicly available information and it's not being put out there. So it's hard to say on the numbers front, uh, but, um, Couple of things. Uh, a, the 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 pre-existing sort of contact points and intermediaries may or may not be available, or they may not want to come through those same intermediaries again. So that means actually finding new ways back to productive employment. The employment itself is not fully there yet, so it's coming back in bits and pieces. And this is of course linked to uh, how global value chains are operating, uh, how uh, and also the increasing informalization across the board, not just for migrant workers, but for skilled workers as well. Uh, so, so definitely, I think it's, it, there, is, there is an experience in which uh, people at the lower end of the skill spectrum are facing uh, the, the brunt of this. Uh, for example, uh, people working in the beauty salons, they used to get monthly salaries plus top up increments for the number of customers they were able to service or the value of services they provided. Now they're only working and commissions. Mm. Not a, nobody is get offering the, the, the base salary anymore, which means that you're on your toes all day to get, uh, to get uh, you know, work. So it's, it's really become, employment overall has become very precarious and it's not come back to its pre-pandemic level that's going to take, in the case of India, a, a, a fairly long time. Uh, so migrant workers who are already disadvantaged and are segment, I mean, sort of, uh, face the, the, the worst part of the labor market segmentation are, are, go, are, are, are definitely facing problems. Great, thank you. Well, we're very nearly the end of the time. So I think what I'd like to do is give both our speakers just a moment to wrap up if there's any kind of key points um, that you want to, to, to tie up before we end. I mean, there's, there are more questions than we're able to ask, but we have covered the, the, the biggest points that, um, that, that people have raised. But I, as I say, there's, there's questions ranging from what's the impact of climate change on migration to really detailed questions about policy, which, which I will pass on to the, to the speakers, but we won't be able to, to answer today. So Priya and Mukta, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. If you do want to have any kind of just key things for us to take away um, to end, that would be great. Okay. so. Um... I would just like to say that, um, yes, I think what's happened as a result of the lockdown is that there has been, um, you know, precarization all round, you know, and that, that applies to both the employers of the migrants and the migrants themselves, you know, because the employers weren't offered any help either, you know, although some of them were ordered to continue paying them or providing relief, they couldn't in fact, managed to do that themselves because their businesses had, had evaporated as well. So it will now take some time for anything to recover and go back to the kind of pre-lockdown situation. However, what we do see is hope that that recovery will happen in urban areas, whereas that hope is not there for rural areas. You know, although migrants have heard indirectly or directly that a number of programs are being announced. Um, because of the track record, they don't 
you know, nurture the same kind of hope for their own areas of origin. And, you know, it's a sad state of affairs. And I feel that, you know, that this, that's something that needs to be understood and needs to be changed, you know. So everybody who is trying to bring about change needs to sort of be aware of those realities about how migrants view their own places of origin and the places that they're going to. So with that kind of, you know, understanding of the political economy or the reality of their lives. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for, for really nice questions. I enjoyed it as well. And Mukta, did you want to say something just to, to wrap up? Um, I think we've, we've already said a lot and covered uh, many, many different points. It's a complex subject, uh, but uh, I'm less hopeful that migrants will, will suddenly be like this, this sort of focus for, for intervention. Uh, so I think a broader conversation on, on, on why mobility of labor or why mobility of people is, is, is a necessary uh, part of, uh, of not just, the, of course, the economy, but also uh, in terms of diversity and culture. Culture. And these are conversations that have happened uh, elsewhere in the world, but somehow the internal migration discourse mm -hmm. doesn't sometimes take some of this into account and, 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 and you know, it, it sort of gets reduced to uh, polit local politics and, and factional politics. Uh, but it, there's a lot more than that. I mean, the, so for example, regional festivals from Bihar are now major festivals in cities across India. So that's, you know, however much you, there are sections of the population that may resent outsiders, uh, there has been a long history of, of internal migration in India. So, so I just sort of, I think that this discourse is very economic, sort of the, the economics is the key lens through which this is seen. And while that's really important and it's useful, it's, it's a much broader discourse and that will really help, I think, forge uh, uh, the bottom up solutions that we want to see uh, in the future. And I, and I also don't see tech as the evil here. I think a lot of technology companies actually want to, uh, it, it, they, they, they understand that they need to come on top of a lot of other base knowledge, but the base knowledge is not there. So I think that matchmaking and, and very careful stitching together uh, of, of the knowledge that we have is the need of the hour. And it's not, it's not impossible to do. It's just something that we need to prioritize and, and start mm -hmm. doing. Yes, and I think if I can just end on one also positive note, I think the very fact that migration is being talked about and being talked about by policymakers and that they are listening, I think, is, is something to be, to be, you know, feel positive about. So thank you both. Thank you, Priya. And thank you, Mukta, for a really great talk. Really, really interesting. I think we've all learned lots and everyone's really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Thank you, Grace. Great job there. And the IDS team, of course. They've got their cameras. Yeah. Thank you, IDS team. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.